In this, our, our final class uh, on religious practices, we're going to be looking at examples from Buddhism. And we'll start with meditation, uh, and then examine the celebration of three major events related to the Buddha's life, his birth, his enlightenment, and his entrance into nirvana. And these are all based on traditional stories. Don't have to take them literally. And then we'll conclude with three uh, lesser known celebrations in various parts of the Buddhist world. So, since Buddhism is less anthropomorphic in its approach to ultimate reality, meaning it doesn't consider a creator God that's personal. Okay? So it's less, that's what anthropomorphism means, a personal God. So it's not, most Buddhist, they're, they're, you don't have that. Um, there are popular expressions of it, and I'll say something short down the line, and I should probably say this about every religion, there's the, the higher echelon intellectual tradition of religion, and always beneath that there's a popular level, the way people often practice and, and add other things to their religion. If you go to Tibet, for example, you'll find it hard to think, from what I've heard from Dr. Bill about Buddhism, this doesn't seem to fit because they're worshiping ghosts and things like that. Well, that's because that's the popular aspect of the tradition. But anyway, um, since it's not anthropomorphic, you don't really find what we call prayer, but you find meditation. So it's not technically a ritual, but it does follow certain patterns and procedures they come close to being ritualistic. You just don't sit down and start meditating. You had to follow certain uh, uh, practices that, that, uh, that go along with meditation. And whenever I say anything about meditation, there's similar practices used across all the Buddhist schools, but there's a large number of diverse meditative traditions. Uh, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism alone, there are 50 different methods. So I'm trying to speak in general here, and probably what you've heard more about meditation here in the West, okay, rather than how you'd experience it in Tibet or, um, or, or some other Buddhist country. Um, so one of the most common elements found in nearly all Buddhist meditation is known as right mindfulness right mindfulness. Through proper posture and breath, the practitioner brings his or her awareness to focus on the inner experience of the present moment by paying close attention to what's going on. You're sitting there quietly and you're, it's interesting, you're observing yourself which is an interesting idea when you think about it. Who's looking at whom? Anyway, you're, you're, there's, it's self-observing. Um, paying close attention to the, what the mind is doing. Again, something's watching the mind. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? How can your mind watch itself? In any case, by noticing that the mind is continually making commentary. You ever notice that? Try and sit quietly. Your mind's gonna be all over the place. They call it monkey mind, okay? You, so when, this is what a lot of, why a lot of people find meditation difficult at the beginning. You're supposed to quiet your mind, and the more you try to quiet it, the more it races, okay? But you're supposed to just sit there and observe that. Uh, and, and then you see your thoughts for what they are. What could that mean? Your thoughts are coming from your mind. You're observing them. So to some degree, you that are observing are distinct from what you're observing. For example, we do this, what is consciousness? I'm the subject, you're my object of consciousness, there's a subject and an object. 
This then can be applied to yourself. You can observe your mind. And as you do that, you begin to notice how little control you have over it. Which is interesting. We tend to think we're our minds. What meditation is trying to get to is a state that is deeper than cognitive thought. Something that is deeper and can be experienced. You come to recognize that thoughts are just thoughts. And the individual is free to release these thoughts. What do we tend to do with our thoughts automatically? We tend to grab onto them, and then they carry us away. Meditation says you can get to a state where you observe your mind as if it's almost something other than yourself, and you can let it go. You can let it go, and then you will get to a point of tranquility, of inner peace, because you've gone deeper than just the brain's actions. That's what meditation is all about. It's getting to that calm, inner peace, that, that moment which is beyond what's going on in your mind. We tend to identify ourselves with our minds. This is saying minds are part of us, but there is a deeper level. And that's what meditation tries to get at. That moment, that eternal moment that has no content. Try that sometimes. It's not easy. But over time, well, you tend to get that a little bit when you sleep, when you start to go to sleep. Your mind will be acting, then you'll sort of calm down and go. Yeah. So, um, so, so this allows for the realization of the experience of what is called your Buddha nature. That part of you which is not your mind, but is definitely part of you. It's who you are fundamentally, actually. The mind is dependent on the brain. Who controls the brain? The brain does. We know that even through science. The brain controls itself. This is saying that there is an element of being that is below that, that can observe that, and can remove yourself from that. You are not your body. You are not your brain. You are not even your mind. Because all those things are doing what? Constantly changing. Constantly passing. OK, there is one other form of meditation called walking meditation. So you don't have to necessarily sit, although most meditation is done in a sitting lotus posture. But there's walking meditation. Uh, you want to say something about walking meditation, Chris, since you, you practice it quite a bit? Give an example. Chris. Walk down the row. <laughs> because it is, when I say walking, it's not, it's, it's very slow walking. So you're um, connecting your breath to your feet. So you breathe in and take a step, and breathe out and take a step, and breathe in and take a step, and breathe out and take a step. So it's very slow and um, deliberate, and that is a focus meditation, not an open awareness meditation, which can be that you just open up to the sights and sounds around you. This is very focused in the sense that you're focusing your um, breath to your steps, and that focus is meant to calm your mind. Like sitting meditation does. Outside. Are you looking around? Because it seems like you would be distracted by, oh, yeah. look at the pretty flowers, yeah, look at the yeah. tree, look at oh, your car. You yeah. know, it seems right. like that's that's open awareness meditation, which is another form of meditation that you're recognizing your 
senses, sensing what you see, what you hear, what you feel. But for this, would they just be maybe concentrating on the concrete or? Um, <laughs> well, yes, I think just uh, in front of you, just walking with it. So are you safe? If I were on my sidewalk in front of my house, would I be safe in the sense of being aware that a car wasn't coming at me or an animal? Oh, sure. sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. You're, you're still aware of the your environment and your surroundings. That, um, that's not what you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. I don't want the dog to get me. No. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I When Barry Curzon was here and we were doing a walking meditation at one of the... Uh, the local hotels, all these people walking in the garden like that. <laughs> How do you think the people in the hotel were? You, you usually don't see people walking slowly. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is you'll, you'll learn that uh, it takes some balance. If you're walking slowly, I mean, we tend to keep up because of our momentum, right? <laughs> but if you're walking slowly, you also have that balance. Okay. So let us now turn to uh, major Buddhist celebrations. Uh, Vesak is also known as Buddhist Jayanti, and it's the birthday of the Buddha, one of the most important of all Buddhist festivals. It's celebrated on different dates in different countries between the months of April and June. The traditional story of the bir Buddha's birth recounts how Queen Maya, his mother, retired to her quarters to rest, to sleep. She fell asleep and had a dream in which a magnificent white bull elephant bearing a white lotus in its trunk approached her. It walked around her three times. Now this is the myth, okay? Then struck her on the right side with its trunk and vanished into her. That's the dream. Now, of course, uh, when she awoke, she told her husband, the king, about the dream. He called his 64 Brahmins, or priests, to interpret it. The Brahmins analyzed the dream and said Queen Maya would give birth to a son who would become a great man. When the time for the birth grew near, Maya told the king she wished to go to her childhood home to give birth. Let's see some comparisons here. On the way, the procession passed what is known as Lumbini Grove, which was full of blossoming trees. As the queen reached up to touch the blossoms, her son was born. Surrounded by various smaller gods, the infant stood up, took seven steps, and proclaimed, I am the world honored one. <laughs> now remember, this is mythology. You don't have to take it literally to get the sense of the meaning. Okay? And we need to remember that in our own traditions as well. So according to a later biographical legends, during the birth celebrations, the uh, hermit, whose name was Asita, journeyed from his mountain abode down to the grove. He examined the child for the 32 marks of a great man and then announced that he would either become a great king or a great religious leader. Which do you think his father wanted? Sedona held a naming ceremony on the fifth day after the birth and invited eight Brahmin scholars to read the future. Seven gave sort of open-ended predictions. Only the youngest, by the name of Kondana, predicted he would become a Buddha. Remember, Buddha is a title. It's not a name. Just like Christ is a title and not a name. Buddha means the awakened one. It often says the enlightened one, but literally one who is awake one who has awoken. It comes from bodhi, which is the uh, word for light, bodhi. Um, so on this act, Buddhists assemble in their various temples before dawn. This is part of this ceremony. 
for the singing of hymns in praise of what is known as the Holy Triple Gem. What is the Holy Triple Gem? The Buddha, the Dharma, or the path, his teachings, and the Sangha, his community. That's the Triple Gem, the individual Buddha, his path, and the community. Devotees bring flowers and candles to lay at the foot, foot of a Buddha image. This is very similar to Hindu puja. Do you remember offering candles and food offerings to an idol? Um, the symbolic offerings are to remind followers, and this is interesting, that just as the beautiful flowers will wither away after a short while, the candles will soon burn out, so too is all life subject to change and destruction. Nothing is permanent. One of the most key of all Buddhist ideas. One that's hard to accept. We like to think things will last, but reality is such that things don't last. Devotees are enjoined to make special effort to refrain from killing of any kind. They are encouraged to partake of vegetarian food for the day. Not all Buddhists are vegetarians. Most are, but not all. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Also, birds are released. It is what is known as a symbolic act of liberation. When you're liberated from something, what does that mean? You're set free from it. So what do you think this symbolizes? What needs to be set free? Your ego, your self from this world of samsara. If you're attached to this world of samsara, eventually, by definition, you will suffer if you're attached. Right? I mean, if you're attached to something and you're going to lose it, you're going to suffer. So the idea in Buddhism is to get beyond that attachment to the things of the world, to your deeper inner Buddha nature. And I'll get to that later. What's that? They have different Buddhas. Oh, yeah, there's all sorts of images of Buddhas. Well, but when we do Buddhist art, come here and you'll see them all. <laughs> when we do the religious art class, yeah, there's all the different uh, icons of the Buddha. Some of the more devout believers will spend the whole day in a Buddhist temple uh, uh, reflecting, meditating on the Buddhist precepts. Some temples will display a statue of the Buddha located in a small basin that has been filled with water and decorated with flowers. Devotees are allowed to pour water over the statue. This is symbolic of the cleansing of the practitioner's bad karma. Your karma are your actions. So those actions which are bad karma are those which are going to cause either you or others suffering. So this is a ritual, kind of, and notice water is related. It's a purification ritual. Help you get rid of your bad karma. In other traditions, to help you get rid of your sins, okay? Find this in all religions. This need to, to be reborn, as it were. To get rid of that past that's hanging on to you from things you have done which you perhaps would not like. If you could have redone them, you would. But you can't, right? <laughs> so you always find these sorts of rituals. In the evening, Buddhist temples are often decorated with numerous lanterns. So that's Vesak. That's the Buddha's birthday. The next one is known as Bodhi Day. Bodhi Day. There should only be one D there, by the way. It's a holiday which falls on December 8th and celebrates the day when Siddhartha Gautama sat underneath the Bodhi tree and attained enlightenment. If you know the Buddha's story, 
which you all do, I'm sure. Well, let's... Uh, it was a culmination of a long spiritual voyage or journey. Uh, it started with his decision to leave the princely life. Remember, his father was a king. He was a prince. He was raised in the palace. When his father found out that uh, the Brahmins thought he would be a great religious leader and not a king, he did everything he could to try and prevent that, kept him locked in the palace, just let him do anything he wanted. He had all the video games he needed. Uh, he got him a BMW when he was 16, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But one day, according to the story, he asks his charioteer to take him out into the world. He's only seen pleasure. That's the, pal the pleasure palace. And he goes out and he has what are known as the four visions. And you can probably, I don't know if you can see them there. One is old age, one is sickness, one is death, and then one is a sadhu or a holy man. And, and after each of these, he asks his charioteer, what's that? He's never seen anyone ill. So that's sickness. This happens to everybody eventually. What's that? What's that old guy with the no teeth? That's old age. And then he sees a corpse. Okay, so this leads him to want to fight, to go on his journey to find some answer to these problems. So he spent a number of years as an ascetic. This is a very early uh, Buddhist statue from from the, from the area that is now uh, Pakistan. It's called the Buddha uh, when he was um, fasting. In other words, he, his first attempt was just get rid of all the bodily desires. Eat as little as possible. Uh, and so he goes through that stage. But he finds eventually that that doesn't solve the problem. So he eventually ends up in a place called Gaya in northern India. And he sits down beneath what is known as the Bodhi tree. And he decides that he is going to meditate here uh, until he finds the answer to his problems. Um, you can visit, this is at a very beautiful temple in Gaia. The tree is said to be the descendant of the original tree through cuttings. Who knows? It doesn't always matter what is as to what people believe. Um, so he was sitting there in meditation, and he said, I'm not going to get up until I either find an answer or... <laughs> and he was sitting there, and during this time, he went back to a time when he was young, a young boy, during a plowing ceremony, when he was in a state of complete detachment. He was just so interested in what was going on around him that he lost any sense of self. And that began to open him up to the answer to the problem. Our problems are based on our sense of self and attachment. That is what we have to get over. Uh, so he thought of a practice of self-forgetting. Self-forgetting. And he sat in meditation according to the tradition for seven days, which it is said all the insights came to him, including this illusion of self. But then he faced the final challenge. Mara appeared to him in various forms to tempt him. Does that sound familiar? Mara is the Buddhist equivalent of Satan, the last big temptation. Um, and the last one was offering his 10 beautiful daughters to Siddhartha. Siddhartha rejected the temptations, and this is, if you ever see Buddhist statuary, you will often see this, the Buddha touching the earth. He's touching the earth. That means he's centering himself. It's, a, it's sort of a symbol of meditation. That's one thing, meditation, to so center yourself in your deepest self. So that's the symbol, he centered himself. And he saw that all these things that were being offered him, similar to what Jesus was offered, right? Power. Well, what do they do? They don't bring you any peace. They don't answer the basic problems of life. They're just big diversions. The world of power, greed, money. They're all diversions 
from the big issue. And when he did that, Mara fled, and at that point, Siddhartha became the Buddha, the enlightened one. The event would become the central foundation upon which Buddhism has been built. This is the moment of enlightenment. It's on a day when followers can renew their dedication to Buddhism, refer, uh, reaffirm themselves to compassion, to kindness, to all living creatures. So Bodhi Day, which is the day that this event is celebrated, is celebrated in a number of different ways. One of the most common is for Buddhist homes to erect this ficus religiosa tree and decorate it. Sound familiar? Much in the manner as Christmas trees are decorated. Because what are trees symbolic of? Life. The roots that go deep down and are solid. Family tree, yeah. They go down and they go out. So they're, they're that beautiful connection. Um, uh, they'll also put on special ornaments that represent the three jewels. <coughs> Quick quiz. Because I told you what the three jewels were at the beginning. The Buddha, Dharma. the Dharma, his teachings, and the community. Um, some people will spend day and night meditating on the life of the Buddha. Others will visit temples and shrines. And in some homes, you will get served special <laughs> Bodhi cookies. So that's the second major in that. Then there is Dhamma Day which is typically takes place in July. It's again one of Buddhism's most important festivals, celebrating as it does the Buddha's first sermon in which he set out to his original five followers the teachings that had resulted from his enlightenment. So according to the traditional story, immediately after his awakening under the Bodhi tree, he hesitated, and this is interesting. He was not sure whether he should now teach what he had learned to others. This was because he felt that humans were so overpowered by their passions, their ignorance, their greed, and hatred that they could never recognize the truth of the path. Which is subtle, deep, and very hard to grasp. So he hesitated. Why? He looked at the world around him, okay, like we are probably today. Why should I go out and teach these people this? They're so full of hatred. They're so full of greed. They're so full of power, desires. It would just be a useless effort. But, According to the tradition, the god Brahma comes to the rescue, convinces him, arguing that at least some, and I like the way this was put, with just a little dust in their eyes will understand it. There are some who will be able to understand it. After hearing Brahma, the Buddha relented and agreed to teach his dhamma, or his path. He initially intended to visit his former teachers to give them his insights, but they were all dead. So he decided to visit five former companions who he traveled with during his uh, searching. Um, so he, he set out for this uh, holy city of Varanasi. I think I've showed you. Varanasi is where they have uh, all the great temples and where the dead are cremated on the banks of the Ganga. So he set out for Varanasi. And on his way, he met another wanderer by the name of, oh, that's Brahmaloka, Upaka. And this is interesting. He proclaimed to Upaka what he had learned, and Upaka wasn't convinced and said, no, I'm going to find my own way. 
The only reason I mention this, has anyone read the novel by Herman Hess called Siddhartha? If you haven't, it's a great little read, and it's, it shows you a lot of insight about Indian thought. What's the title? Siddhartha. Yes, I, it, there's a movie, there was a movie made of it, too, if you want to probably get it on Netflix. But in that, the hero Siddhartha is searching, and he comes across the Buddha. He and his friend have come across the Buddha. His friend decides to follow the Buddha. Siddhartha says, no, I have to find my own way, which was Hermann Hesse, of course. But uh, it, it, he, prob he may well have gotten that from this tradition, because he goes out, and the first, one of his old says, no, I'll find my own way. Anyway, uh, so when the Buddha reaches a place called Deer Park, in a place called Sarnath, which is about 10 miles north of Varanasi, he met some of his former companions, was able to convince them uh, that he had reached full awakening. So these are like the, the, the original disciples, okay? First five. And he gave his first sermon, which is known, putting into motion the wheel of the law. The wheel of the law, or the Dhamma, in which he encapsulated the Four Noble Truths, that life is suffering, suffering is caused by desire, desire can be overcome by following the Eightfold Path, which involves proper ethics, proper meditation, and more than anything else, a deep sense of detachment. Now, detachment doesn't mean not caring. Okay, when we think of being detached, I'm just not going to care. Detachment means not caring about yourself. Because one of the biggest Buddhist uh, virtues is compassion. You have detachment for yourself and compassion for others. Uh, at the end of the sermon, one of the five uh, recounted his understanding. Buddha said, you got it, mate. You're right. And this was the beginning of what was known as the first Sangha, the first Buddhist community. So somewhat equivalent to the uh, first disciples in Christ in his early Christian community. So the day is observed by Buddhists by visiting temples. Uh, there they give small donations to the monks, often listen to a sermon to remind them of this great beginning of, not the beginning, of, uh, this isn't the enlightenment, this is the beginning of the religion. This is the beginning of going out and teaching the Dhamma to others. Yeah. The first Buddha said, nah, not worth it. Now this is his mission. Anybody recognize that gentleman? Dalai yeah, Dalai Lama giving a sermon. Yeah. Um, at the end of the evening, they attend a ceremony where they walk around the temple holding lit incense sticks and candles and chanting alongside the monks. So the local community will gather with the monks. They're, it's a, it's a, 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 candles and light, and they go around the temple. Circumambulation, it's called. We find this in many religions. Remember in, in Islam, circumambulating around the Kaaba, going in this circle. It's the circle of life. It's the circle of life. Um, it celebrates the day when the, um, you know, okay. Next, Parinirvana Day. Pari means final. So it's final Nirvana Day. It's the most significant of many Buddhist holidays cel separated, celebrated in East Asia. It takes place on February the 15th celebrates the day when upon the death of his physical body, the Buddha is said to have achieved liberation from the cycle and death of samsara. I mentioned that term many times, samsara. It's the phenomenal world. It's like a spinning, always changing, people grasping onto it, hoping to find something that'll last. Just one more Super Bowl and I'll be fine. Yeah. It's just, but it's nature. It's almost like trying to grasp water. Right? It'll squirt out of your hands. So this is the celebration of his getting off of this cycle of samsara. In the Buddhist view, when people die, 
their physical bodies disintegrate, and their karma, their, the consequences of their actions, which is kept in bodily energy. It's an energy. It passes on to a new birth. And this is what we call reincarnation. However, when a person attains nirvana, they are liberated from this karmic rebirth. How many rebirths will you have? As many as it takes to get you free. Okay? There are many, there are many Buddhist uh, uh, gatas or uh, kind of like prayers where they say, in my innumerable lives of the past, in my 100,000 lives of the past, I have been chained to samsara. And I, so you got a lot of time. <laughs> Indian thought never had trouble with the immensity of time and space. From very early on, they knew that the earth was not 6,000 years old. <laughs> they knew it was millions of years old, was one of many small planets in large galaxies. So they had that awareness. Um, this is what uh, one, a, a contemporary Buddhist scholar has to say about nirvana. Eventually, that's for one who is going to be able to leave, the remainder of life will be exhausted. All your karma will finally burn out. Like all beings, a person must die. But unlike other beings who have not experienced nirvana, he or she will not be reborn in some new life. The physical and mental constituents of being will not come together in some new existence. There will be no new being or person. Instead of being reborn, the person's physical and mental phenomena that constitute his being cease to occur. This is the condition of nirvana, pure consciousness without content. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? Although you've probably come close to it once in a while. Have you ever been in that state where you're conscious, but there's, you're not aware of yourself? You're not necessarily thinking about anything. You're just sort of there. All this other stuff has left you. Well, that's the ultimate goal. And that's what the Buddhist teachings are all about. So the traditional story is told as follows. 45 years had passed since he, so he taught for 45 years. He and his started with five. They spread down the Gangetic Valley of North India. And by the time of his passing, there were thousands and thousands of monks. Uh, so one day the Buddhist asked the monks to leave the group and find other places to stay. He also told them he would remain alone with only the company of his cousin, the close companion. Well, there's Nirvana. So he addresses his monk and says, I need to be alone. I'm only taking one of you with me. And that was his cousin Ananda. This is actually from a famous uh, uh, wall carving in China. And he's the middle one. It's Ananda. Ananda can be compared to Peter, if you want to compare him to the Christian tradition. After the monks had left, Ananda could see that his master was ill. So the Buddha was sick. Even the Buddha will experience all the visions. Even the Buddha will get sick. Even the Buddha will die. Uh, the Blessed One, as the Buddha is called, uh, was in great pain and only found comfort in deep meditation. Now that's, I've been in quite a bit of pain lately, and one of the things I've noticed, I wouldn't call it traditional meditation, but when I lie down and just try and not think, or not be aware, it doesn't go away, but it really lessens to some degree. That's why I can sleep pretty well at night. Well, in deep meditation, as I said, you can get, you can get beyond all of that because you're so deep and so removed from the mind aspect of your being 
you don't even feel things. Uh, in any case, so he was in deep meditation. Uh, and with the strength of the will, he overcame his illness. Ananda was relieved but shaken, and he said, when I saw the Blessed One's sickness, my own body became weak. Everything became dim to me, and my senses failed. What's he putting his attention on? The Buddha's body, the Buddha's person. And the Buddha will, down the line, instruct him that that's not the right vision. Hmm? The Buddha responded, what more does the community of monks expect from me, Ananda? I have taught the Dharma. I have taught the path openly and completely. I have held nothing back and have nothing more to add to the teachings. Now I am frail, Ananda. I am old, far gone in years. This is my 80th year. My life is spent. My body is like an old cart barely held together. Therefore, Ananda, you and your monks must be islands unto yourselves, refugees unto yourselves, seeking no other refuge than the path. See what he's saying? I'm going. I'm dying. The path, the teachings, that's what you focus on. Not me, the person, the teachings, the Dhamma, the path. Uh, uh, who jumps up again? <laughs> the Buddha was visited by Mara, who 45 years early had tried to tempt him away from final enlightenment. This time he attempted to sow seeds of fear and doubt. As one is dying, often the fear and doubt start to enter. The Buddha said, do not trouble yourself, evil one. In three months, I will pass away and enter nirvana. The earth responded by shaking. Now, this is the myth. This is the myth. Okay. Remember, touching the earth, the earth shakes. He, when is a great shaking of the earth in Christianity? Yes, after the, after the crucifixion and the temple the curtain is split, yeah. When the quake had subsided, the Buddha told Ananda and the others about his decision to make his final entry into nirvana in three months. So they go to a town called Kushinagar. And there he was given a meal by one of the local, not a monk, but a man of some wealth who supported the Buddha Sangha. Uh, after the meal, he got ill. It, uh, tradition said it might have been pork or something, maybe wild mushrooms related to pork, which is interesting because the Buddha would have eaten pork. So as I said earlier, not all Buddhists are vegetarian. Even the Dalai Lama has had meat when he was not well. And Barry Curzon, our monk friend, who was suffering from anemia, Dalai Lama said, eat some meat. It's the idea, you, it's, it's for a purpose. It's not just to be done ritualistically. If what you're doing is causing you ill health, that's more important. So anyway, uh, so he laid down. This is the famous lying Buddha, which we will see many, uh, you'll see many statues, the declining Buddha. On his right side, one foot upon the other, with his head supported by his right hand. Then the trees bloomed, although it was not the season, and the petals rained down upon the Buddha. When did they rain down initially? At his birth. Nice bringing together. Petals down on his birth, petals down on his death. The Buddha then spoke for a time to his monks. At one point, Ananda left the grove to lean against the door and weep. The Buddha said, a monk said, find Ananda and bring him back. Then he said to Ananda, enough, Ananda. Do not grieve. Have I not taught from the very beginning 
that with all that is dear and beloved, there must be change and separation. All that is born comes into being, is compounded, and is subject to decay. How can one say, may it not come to my dissolution? The Buddha assured all the monks they would eventually realize enlightenment. And then he said, all compounded things are subject to decay, strive with diligence. And serenely, he passed into Pari Nirvana. So the Buddha had instructed his followers to cremate his body and distribute the relics among the various groups of his followers. What might be the relics? Not the ashes so much, but what doesn't burn up? Bones, teeth, and things like that. Yeah. That was the beginning of uh, having relics at stupas. around. Just you know how in cathedrals and in uh, Christianity you have relics like a piece of the cross or nails or, yeah. The shroud. In any case, um, later the king Ashoka, who a Mauryan king who had become a Buddhist, would distribute these in various stupas all around India. So if you visit various stupas, one of the oldest being in Sanchi, which goes back to the fourth century, there are relics in there that still exist. Okay, on Parinirvana Day, oh, that. is cremation. Sorry, Mike, I got these out of, <laughs> you're going to have to edit these. <laughs> oh, so that you, and you can't have another take. <laughs> yeah, so Pari Nirvana lights, they celebrate with uh, uh, and they, what's interesting is that they have these lights and then they all go out one at a time, except for one. And that one light represents the hope for the return of the Buddha, which in mythology becomes known as Buddha Maitreya, the Buddha of the future who will return. Uh, there are visits to temples, there are scripture readings. And then there's some beautiful works of art. For example, this weeping for the Buddha. We visited this in Kyoto, and it was a you walk into the building and it's what do you in the round, and the entire uh, building was surrounded by these, uh, this work of art called Weeping for the Buddha. Even the elephant weeps. Okay. Um, three more, three what I call minor celebrations, not major, but still significant for many people. Uh, Ancestor Day, the Festival of the Floating Bowls, and the Robe Offering Ceremony. So Ancestor Day celebrates the time when the gates of the ghost world open up, allowing ghosts to wander about the world for 15 days. Now I said something earlier about popular religion. You don't find this in the high tradition but you will find it in many Asian countries as popular religion, probably brought into Buddhist practice through common cultural practices of ancestor worship. Um, so at this time, it is common to see Buddhists offer food to the ghosts. Just kind of like Day of the Dead. Yeah, something like Day of the Dead. Yeah, ancestor worship is, is, is a universal. Um, and so it's celebrated for 15 days. The, um, when the 15th day is reached, then you have Ancestor Day. People go to cemeteries. They make offerings. They go to cemeteries for, to make offerings for their ancestors. Um, 
by remembering the ancestors, believers spiritually join them in sacred time. Sacred time isn't like ordinary time. It's a time when you and your ancestors are together. Is it real? Well, if you believe it is. So it's the notion of bringing your time to a situation where the past, present, and future become one. I, you know, I, yeah, those are, those are graves, but what they'll, many of these will be cremations, and then, then you pour the, put the ashes in the ground, yeah, not so much the body. If you put more than one family member in there, they just They probably, yeah, and like anywhere, the wealthier the family, <laughs> the bigger the pod, <laughs> and you, yeah. Um, in Japan, Yeah, we, right, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we go out to, um, Forest Lawn is in, in down where I live, but what's the one out here called? Canal Valley, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, in Japan it's called Oban, or Bon Odori, uh, which occurs between July and August, and it's based on the lunar calendar. Um, it originates from the story of this gentleman, Mokurin, who was a disciple of the Buddha, who used his supernatural powers to look upon his deceased mother. Only to discover she had fallen into the realm of the hungry ghosts and was suffering. Greatly disturbed, he went to the Buddha, asked him how he could relieve her, the Buddha instructed him to make offerings to the Buddhist monks who had just completed the summer retreat on the 15th day of the seventh month. He did this and consequently saw his mother's release. But he also began to see the true nature of her past selflessness and the sacrifices she had made for him during her lifetime. Happy for his mother's release from suffering, grateful for her many kindnesses, he danced with joy, and that's why you have the bone dance as part of this ceremony. The timing during which ancestors and their sacrifices are remembered and appreciated with joy. Many of these Obon celebrations include a large carnival with rides, games, summer foods. Uh, families spend time together, uh, send their ancestors back to their permanent dwelling place. So the ghosts come out for 15 days. You sort of associate with them, give them what they need, and then they go back. But it's, it's, not, it's sort of bringing the past into the present. You bring the ancestors into the present. The name Okaburi roughly translates as send off fire because there's, well, there's the dance. There's often a fire at the end of the celebration. Okay, the last one is known as the Loi Koton festival or the festival of the floating bowls. It's observed in Thailand. It's the time when waters fill the local rivers and canals on the full moon night of the 12th lunar month. Loi means float, and Kratong is a little basket boat containing small flowers and offerings. During the festival, Incense sticks and candles are placed in bowls made from leaves, brought to the canals, and set afloat. And quite elaborate. They're traditionally made of banana leaves, spider lily plant. Modern kratongs are more often made of bread, which will disintegrate and can be eaten by the fish. A small coin is sometimes included as an offering to the river spirits. 
Now again, this is popular Buddhism, but it's important to recognize that most Buddhists around the world incorporate local traditions in with the higher tradition. So there's always the, the major tradition and the minor tradition in any religion. Um, Buddhists in Thailand regard the Kretongs as the symbol of the journey of the soul across the river of samsara. In Buddhist tradition, the Dharma or the path is pictured as a raft that takes one to the other shore. So what is your boat or your raft? Not the Buddha, although many popular practices would th make you think so. What is it? The path, the Dhamma. That's what will take you across. Uh, for some it is said uh, that your bad luck will escape you when you practice this tradition. So again, that's another popular superstition, maybe. Uh, it's also said it unites the believer with there's, that those are at night. There's the Dharma boat. That's a great one. With the sacred footprint. I think I've mentioned that before, the, the sacred footprint that you find in all religions, um, uh, which I think it symbolizes the sacred and the profane where they come together. It's the footprint. It's to the earth. Well, a great import put in Buddhism on the earth. You notice the touching the earth, grounding. You know that term, you, gotta, you, you should be grounded. That means you're not all over the place. You're grounded. And the, the, the real path to grounding is following the Dhamma and meditation practice. Um, the, the ceremony. Um, can be celebrated any day within one month uh, of the year. This is known as the Katina robe offering ceremony. Uh, this is when members present of the Sangha. Most Buddhists aren't monks, okay? they're lay members. So the lay members of the community offer new robes to the monks, yeah, offer new robes. It goes back to a, its practice throughout Asia. It goes back to a tradition where the Buddha was traveling and he offered uh, uh, one of his robes to one of the monks. And this was then followed on as a tradition. Um, and that's called the Katina cloth. So these are collected. There's another one. And there's a procession. They go to the temple with their cloths. They offer them to the monks. The monks then take the katina cloths, sew them together, and choose one monk. It's like monk of the year. <laughs> the one monk who deserves, for some reason, to be given the, the katina. So this, uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this class and also the... Uh, the series on practicing religion, our purpose was really to show you that religion isn't just about ideas or even scriptures. For most people, it's how they practice it, the rituals they follow, uh, the traditions they try to keep up. Um, so that religion is action, not just thinking. Okay, questions, thoughts, insights? Yes, Mary Jo. To be so many different images of Buddha. Mm -hmm. I mean, to a real person, a young person, an old person, everything. And, yeah. and I guess that's okay everywhere. There's no idea of what. No, because no, because the Buddha, like all of us, was on a journey. Yeah, and he goes through the different stages. From what, what's interesting. Early, early Buddhist practice, there were no images of the Buddha. They were prohibited. All you found were symbols. And I'll, when we look at Buddhist art, I'll be talking about this. You'd find either um, a footprint 
or a vacant throne or a Bodhi tree as a symbol of the Buddha. Not, it wasn't until about the first century up in uh, the area of what's Afghanistan today, which had become very influenced by the Greeks because of Alexander the Great, that you started to get statues of the Buddha. It's called the Gandhara period. And then over time, what, what happens is Buddhism spreads to all these different countries. Not only do you get the different uh, images of the Buddha during his lifetime, you get the cultural influences. When you go and you see a Buddha in Japan, it's very different from one in, in Sri Lanka or yeah. etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Some, yes, ma'am. Which countries would have a uh, heavier population of practicing uh, Buddhism? Well, it's interesting. At one time, it would have been China, of course, since the revolution, but, but Buddhism is, is on its way back in, in China. Uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Japan, which mixes it with Shinto, so you get a combination. Um, uh, but mainly your, uh, Sri Lanka, all your, your countries of Southeast Asia. Um, I don't know which one in terms of numbers has the most, but I, would, I, I gather China, even though it's been since the revolution, it was downplayed, but there's been a revival. There's been a revival of uh, most religions in China, as long, <laughs> as long as you don't violate any of the, the states, states' positions. Yeah. Our daughter-in-law was raised Buddhist, mm -hmm. but she's converted to Christianity now. But um, it's interesting. I mean, when we went to temples, and things she'd go back to her old ways, yeah. get the incense, right. do you know right. the worship. She could tell every Buddha she she had things about the lying down Buddha right. and the sitting Buddha, and she had and Buddha is often uh, the knowledge, you know, yeah. the the Buddha, the Buddha with the books. The Buddha as a teacher. There are different mudras or hand positions if you look at Buddha's statuary. One will be touching the earth, one will be teaching, uh, one will be learning, uh, one, the handout, no fear, no fear. So, yeah. There is a, there's a temple in Kyoto called the, um, the Temple of the Thousand Bodhisattvas. It's a magnet, and the bodhisattva is a, is a. I don't want to get into all the details, but it's sort of a, a type of Buddhist reality that uh, helps you out, uh, and they're all gold plated, and you just a thousand of them, uh, and you just walk around, take you about. In Thailand, and you think a poor country with all the golden uh, Buddhas and all the gold around them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do they recruit? Do the monks recruit people to their faith? They're not proselytizing in that sense. Um, early on, yeah, early on. But at, once these Buddhist traditions have been established, you don't find monks going out trying to convert people so much. Um, in the West, you have people joining Buddhist sanghas, but it, it's not a proselytizing sort of effort. So people find out about it or are interested in it, and then will join a group. Uh, Chris joined, is joining, has joined a sangha, in, in, um, and joining a sangha doesn't mean you can't be a member of another religion. It isn't, it isn't exclusive. Did you want to say something, Chris? So the Buddhists don't, aren't like fundamentalists. They don't think that their way is the only way, and others should do it. I, I would say of most of the religions, they're one of the most open to being flexible. Uh, what they will say is not that their beliefs are the only way, but the Dhamma, the psychology, is, is true. <laughs> the world is of a certain way. The way you approach it makes a difference to your psychology. It doesn't matter so much what you believe as how you act and how you relate to the world. 
great emphasis on detachment yeah. and the end of suffering and the use of and the need for compassion. Well, that's yeah. We could go. We could go on here for a long time. Um, one of the main ideas in Buddhism across the board is that everything is connected. Nothing is um, independent. It's called dependent arising. And that's, Buddhism, well, this, I'll, I'll, let me just answer your question this way. <laughs> when the Dalai Lama was in Santa Barbara, no, Universal Studios, I think, when we went to see him, he was asked, how would you define yourself? He said, I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist. What I believe in terms of religion fits with what we know about reality and how we relate to it. So this idea of independent independence is, is not true. Nothing is independent. Everything is connected to something else. It's called the uh, interconnectedness. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh says, when you have your coffee in the morning, think of all the things and all the connections that it took to get you that coffee. We just assume there's the coffee. Is it somehow some independent thing? And when you realize this interdependence, then you realize the connection, then you have compassion. Because we're all connected. Everything is connected one way or another. Yeah, it's an interesting exercise. Just go home and think, OK, just something you did today. Trace all the connections. Trace all the connections. Yeah, nothing is independent. Everything is called codependent arising. And that connection and the recognition that everything is changing. If you get too attached to anything, you're going to suffer. Therefore, you need detachment and compassion. And then you'll have a much more peaceful world. <laughs> if you want to go out and try and control things, well, that's the history of our planet. OK, uh, thanks for spending that extra time. Uh, I apologize, Mike. I got some of the pick. I left some, but uh, Mike needs, you need some more work, don't you? <laughs> thanks. And let's give Mike a big hand. Uh,